Thank you for having me back. It's, it's, it's great to come back to this place and, and, and actually sort of lead a seminar. This, by the way, is the same seminar that I led uh, in the summer. It was my graduation seminar. To, you know, to graduate, you have to uh, lead a seminar. You have to do a 15-minute reading. And there's this business about a thesis. Um, but this is what I, d I put together for my seminar in the summer. Um, and, um, you know, and, and I'm grateful to Bill for asking me to come and do it again. And, um, you know, in the summer, as now, we asked ourselves, um, why would it be important for us to, take, to, do, to have a seminar about workshopping? Um, we all know how to workshop. That's not really the title of, this is really how to workshop better. I mean, we, we, you know, we all know how to workshop. We're graduate students, we've done this. We did this morning. How did workshop go this morning? Any, any, any tears yet? Any, any freakouts? Um, you know, so there's, there's no doubt we know how to workshop. We, um, we, we also know how to write, you know, yet here we are in an MFA program um, uh, trying to hone our skills to write better. Um, so, the, you know, the, the, the thinking behind having a seminar about uh, workshopping is the same thing about uh, all the seminars and workshops to do about, about writing, right? There's, there's writing is a process that works differently for everybody, um, and yet we can come together and, and talk about craft and, and hone our, our skills and actually become better writers and, and sort of examine our process and see what works and what works less well and how to make it all better. I think you can do the same thing for workshopping, which I also see as a process, not just a finite thing that you go to at 9.30 in the morning. Um, it's a process, just like writing it has just a, uh, multiple stages that you kind of, uh, uh, that kind of happen in a, in a cyclical way where you sort of do one and then another, then you may jump back a couple of spots and then go forward and it's, it, it's continually happening. Um, and I think that as writers who are uh, engaged in, in, in becoming better at everything we do, um, it's important to, to really take a critical look at the workshop process and see how we can make it even better. That's why we're here. Thank you for coming. <laughs> okay. Um, the, the, the other part is like, I mean, you know, there's a lot of things we can look at as writers, but one of the things that uh, I think is interesting about a workshop, um, especially in an MFA program, and especially in a low residency M MFA program, where we see each other twice a year, we come, to get, come here for 10 days, uh, we have, you know, chock full days with, uh, with, you know, readings and seminars and so on. The majority of those days are spent in workshop. We spend almost three hours a day in workshop. And, you know, it's, it, it has become, especially for a low-risk program, a very central part of, 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 of getting an MFA. So, you know, I think it's just in everybody's interest to make sure you're doing it as effectively as possible. So, I am going to examine the workshop. We are actually together going to examine the workshop um, as a process. And I'm going to just um, divide it into three um, phases, even though there's probably more. Um, one is before the workshop. Second, we have during. And even though it never really ends, even, even at noon and even when we leave this island, what, what do we do after the workshop? How do we do each of these um, effectively so that we get as much out of the workshop as we want to and we're paying for? Um, so, let's start with before. So let's, uh, let's, let's engage you guys, my wonderful looking audience. Um, what is, what, before we actually get here to the island and we, get, you know, we, we, we go to our respective rooms at 9.30, what happens before that? What is, what is the first thing? Like before, yes? Submitting samples, reading samples. Submitting samples and reading samples. What happens before that? We're going all the way back to the beginning of time here. <laughs> You decide what you're going to write. Then you call through it and decide what you're going to send. Excellent. You, you, do, you figure out exactly what you want to workshop. What you happens? <laughs> Please. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's on the do's and don'ts. Um, what happens before that? Where you're, yeah, this. You live. You read a lot. Yes, of course. These are all things that we do as writers. We experience the world. Um, but is, with uh, specific. Um, uh, regard to the actual workshop, one of the first things that I think has to happen um, is deciding to do the workshop in the first place. It's not just a random thing, right? Um, and, and when you say, uh, as a writer, this is something I think is going to be important to my development as a writer, just taking this workshop, you have to be very deliberate about that. So, you know, it's, it's, it's like, um, 
it's like it's almost like writing you know i one of my processes in writing is i always start with a very loose outline but you know you start somewhere you write some you know like kind of like why are you writing this piece almost right um and i think that before we do anything to do with the workshop we have to kind of answer uh, in some way for ourselves, why are we doing this workshop in the first place? What are our goals? What are our missions? What do we want to get out of it? If you decide what you want to get out of it, then you will be actually better able to do things to make that happen, right? It's not, you, you, it's, it's less effective to go into it blindly because, oh, well, I'm doing an MFA and we're doing workshops, right? Okay, so question is, why? I like to ask this question of everything, why? Why are we having this seminar? Why are we doing a workshop? Why would you want to workshop a piece? What's, uh, what are the benefits of workshopping? Get to see other people's reactions. Okay, so you get real-time reactions and feedback. Writing can be lonely work. We're there at the keyboard and it's just us and the, and the, and the screen and maybe um, a couple of people will read it. Um, but you know, a workshop is a fantastic opportunity to actually to actually open up your work to a, a slightly wider audience and get some real-time feedback. What else? Finding out where to go with it next. Good, so um, I don't know if you can see behind here, but I'm gonna use the entire board, so that's why I have to start over here. Um, get some uh, directional assistance, maybe. Sometimes you have a map, sometimes you have to stop and ask for directions. It's okay, everybody does it. What else? You get to hear other people's things. So that gives you perspective on your own writing. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, see what others are doing, get, uh, let's call it just perspective. Exactly, yeah. What else is, pe what, are, what else are people writing? It's often the case where you don't know what you've written. You've told the story, but you don't know what it's about. Yeah. And you suddenly find out what it's about. Yeah, um, it's almost like you get sort of, um, uh, insight and uh, you know maybe uh, into the actually uh, the identity of the piece right like what is this you know what is it to, I know what I may know what it means to me but what does it mean to somebody else yeah it's very often a very different thing <laughs> anything else the workshop itself can be motivation to write mm, motivation Part of the motivation is that you have a deadline. You gotta get it in. <laughs> yeah. Deadlines are really good for writers. Anything else? Accountability. Oh, accountability is a good one, yes. Correct. Yes. These are all correct, by the way. I mean, these are just, we're just reviewing here. Anything else? Yeah, so again, I think it's good to start off at the very beginning saying, why am I doing this workshop? And, and how uh, can I uh, uh, adjust everything I do to make sure that I, I you know, achieve what I set out to do? And I think, basically, um, I see it as everything here can be distilled into, basically, um, one, getting the feedback, right? So you actually get readers, and two, getting that perspective or that, um, that insight into your own writing. So basically, sometimes, not, I mean, separate from the, feed, the actual feedback you get, sometimes um, reading and commenting on somebody else's work teaches you stuff about your own work. Have you ever found that? Um, and it's so important to learn how to properly critique writing. Why? Because you should be critiquing your own. It's hard to do that. So practice with somebody else's. <laughs> um, and and it's, it's very, very, very important. So I mean, um, okay, so this is good. This is, I'm going to leave this up here because this is going to be the thing that we always refer to and say like, okay, if we're ever going off track with the workshop, let's, let's go back to why we started in the first place. And, and, and that'll help bring us back on track. Okay, good. Um, what's, okay, so now what happens next? We're still in the, the before. This is all before. What happens next after you decided you're actually going to do this for very deliberate reasons, not just because it's something to do? Right to okay, now you have to say, what am I going to workshop? Okay, so um, what does that involve, writing a piece? Panic. Panic. 
Don't panic, panic. Um, <laughs> setting up the font? Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes. All right, we would have to go through every single step, but that's actually true. <laughs> that's actually true. It, 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 you know, don't use windings. I learned the hard way. Um, okay, so uh, you know that the deadline for uh, handing in uh, pieces for workshop, Elizabeth sends out the, de the, the, the deadline sometimes very early. She's like, this semester just started, and I, you know, uh, submissions are due already. And she says, by November 20th, I need your piece. How do you decide what to send in? I'm asking you, how do you? Got, yes. Uh, uh, I usually send in what needs, what I think needs most work. Okay. So. What needs most work? Yeah. I send in what I've been working on. Something you've been working on uh, that, that obviously needs some, some more work. Something I have a specific question. You, you have specific questions on, exactly. Yes, what else, what else? I sent or something that you don't, really don't know how people will, will react to. Yeah. So yeah, again, so going back here to, okay, one of the things you're doing this is for, is for actual feedback. So, you know, I think there is sometimes a, 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 a pull and tug between um, what to send in for a workshop sample or wh whatever, you know, fiction, nonfiction, poetry, drama. Um, we like when people tell us that we're great writers. It's a nice feeling. Um, so, you know, you're not going to send in, you know, sometimes you're like, should I, should I send this in? It's, it's too raw. People are going to hate it. Except that's the point. <laughs> um, so, and, and then, but then you actually want feedback. You want meaningful feedback. So, do you send something in that you've worked really hard on very long and has gone through multiple drafts and is, is, and is close to being polished? So, no. You don't want to send in something that's too brand new and raw because sometimes a piece needs some time with you before it can, uh, we can in face the world. And you, of course you don't want to send in something that's too perfect because everybody's just going to tell you it's great. And that's not useful feedback. Um, so you want to find that, 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 that's, that center and that what, what that is may, will be different for you. But um, you, uh, you can uh, help yourself find it by thinking about the specific questions Did you say. So like, if you have specific questions about a piece or, you, or you've gotten uh, through a couple drafts on something and you're, or you're trying something new or anything that you think you, will, you can actually use meaningful feedback on, do not send in a piece that you don't need or want meaningful feedback on. Uh, this is a true story. That, you know, I was in a workshop one time here, and uh, not in this room, but you know. So, uh, and uh, we were workshopping a, a piece from somebody and the person said, it doesn't matter too much because uh, I'm not really working on this anymore. Um, so don't do that. She's no longer with us. <laughs> um, so I, wanted, I did want to um, refer to, um, yeah, so this is a, um, this handout where it's, it says workshop do's and don'ts. Um, I sent out an email to all the uh, Fairfield faculty and I asked them, you know, give, just give me like from your experience and they, they're professionals and they're very generous and they were able to, I didn't identify what came from whom, but these are all verbatim. I just copied and pasted them into this little handout. It's a nice thing to refer to. Um, and you know, on the, the first don't, on the, on the flip side, the first don't, um, you have this thing where you say, you know, don't send out something um, that you haven't proofread. Workshopping is not proofreading, okay? Um, and, um, and, and getting feedback about your grammar or your punctuation is actually not meaningful feedback. So, you know, don't say, well, yes, of course this piece is raw. That's why I'm putting it here. Raw doesn't mean bad, <laughs> right? It's, 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 it's not helpful for you. I mean, this, is, this entire uh, discussion, this entire examination is um, very selfish in a way. It's, it's really asking yourself, how do I get everything out I want out of this workshop? And if, if, if half the feedback you get is about punctuation, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's just not helpful for you. Okay. Um, on the do front side, uh, about five or six down, or the second one, the second to last one. This is something that I think is very important. Um, and we read it together. It says, uh, do give readers all of the information that they need to make intelligent and informed comments. When you prepare your own sample for the workshop, give a, cl uh, give a clear statement at the beginning specifying if it's a complete story, an incomplete story, or a novel excerpt. If it's an excerpt or incomplete, fill the readers in on the overall context and where the segment fits into the piece. That's so important, especially you know when we when you know we we get 18 pages and maybe if you're taking a master class you got 30 pages. Um, you know uh, you don't want to waste time um, and, and and meaningful feedback with questions 
that are answered elsewhere in the text. You know, just tell them everything they need to know so that when they actually write uh, the feedback to you, you'll get actual meaningful feedback. You don't want to waste time saying, oh, well, I actually uh, covered that in, in chapter two already. You didn't read that. Oh, well, you didn't tell me that. So, um, you know, the idea is to give them all the information they need. And, um, and I think there's also, uh, oh, well, I can't find it now. But anyway, one of these things says, um, which I think is a very useful uh, uh, practice, um, you know, you submit your 18 pages and you, you, give every, you, you give them, you contextualize it, you say this is what you need to know. Um, however, you're submitting those 18 pages for a very specific reason. You know there's something that you want to know about it from other readers. You can ask directly, you know, don't be afraid to ask specific questions, requesting specific feedback if that's what you're looking for because, again, you want to get everything you want out of this, you know. Just, don't just say read it and tell me what you think. If you, you may not always have a specific question, but if you do, ask it because actually it'll help the reader focus on that and give you the kind of feedback you need. It's all about getting feedback to become better. Okay. Um, great. So we've selected 18 or 30 pages. We've sent it in just in the nick of time to Elizabeth. Um, then what happens? Wait. Yeah, then we wait. <laughs> and then what happens? Great. So then Elizabeth does um, some kind of alchemy with Bill and Michael, and somehow you get grouped in with three, four, five, six, sometimes seven other people in a workshop, and, and, and th those submissions get emailed to you. What do you do with them? Read them. How do you read them? With a glass of scotch. <laughs> Very carefully. What does that mean? Yes. So I always read them twice. Okay. How many people read uh, more than once? How many people don't? Be honest, it's okay. Um, good, I'm glad that nobody raised their hand for that because obviously we know that there's uh, uh, specific advantages to reading something more than once. Um, you read it differently the first time and the second time. Um, I also do that, Tom. Uh, I may have told you, that's probably where you got it, is to, um, <laughs> is to uh, go through the first time, no pen, no pencil, um, you're just reading it to, to just get an overall sense of it. Sometimes, um, you know, y y because you want to give meaningful feedback too. I mean, this is part of why we're in this, th this thing is to actually read critically and, and, and speak uh, knowledge being critically about work. Um, so the first thing you might want to do is just find, get a sense of what kind of critique does this work need, right? Where, where is this? What, what is the author trying to do? And sometimes more important, what the, is the piece trying to do, which doesn't always cohere with what the author is trying to do. Um, so here, we can refer to the uh, handout from Charles Baxter. On uh, the front side, in the third paragraph, he says, when preparing for the workshop, participants should first try to discover the work's intentions, right? right? Setting aside for the moment your own, your own taste. So that, to me, is like that's your first read. You're not marking things. You may, you know, put an asterisk, you may underline something to come back to, but you're not spending time because it's almost like, um, you know, when, uh, when you're having a conversation with somebody and they're talking and you say, oh, I have something to say to that, right? Uh, and, uh, and, and, and you're like, okay, you know, I don't want to interrupt, that's rude, so I'll try to just keep remembering it. But while, you're, while you've got that in your head, you're actually missing what else they're saying. So, um, you know, using that analogy for the, for the piece, Read it the first time without anything in your head. Just he listen, listen to the piece, listen to what it's saying. Um, and then the second time, again, I go through, now with a pen in hand, you know, maybe I've made some notes to, 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 to specifically comment on, um, and, and try to uh, write some meaningful feedback on the manuscript itself. Um, has anybody ever been in a workshop and gotten back a piece with no writing on it? How did, how did it make you feel? Think about that when, when you decide whether to write on, on some of these. You have to, right? Uh, this is why we're here. So um, yeah, so that's the second read. And then um, I actually do a, a third read. One up here. And that's, that's uh, you know, sometimes that's, uh, I let's, you know, a couple weeks pass. We usually have about five or six weeks be, be, uh, before the residency. So I, I let it sort of simmer and, 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 and bake in there. And then, like, maybe right before the residency, I'll give it another uh, uh, one last read. And because sometimes, um, you know, that, uh, that may change some of your, some of your feedback where, you know, um, 
What's, one kind of feedback that's interesting to give authors is, what was your first impression? And maybe what was your second impression, right? So now you have, you, you know, you, you have a sort of layered um, context to, to give some feedback on. Okay, and then the other thing I do sometimes, um, which you don't have to do for the entire piece because they're very long, but certainly try for maybe a page or two to read an excerpt aloud. Uh, maybe that on your first read. I, again, you know, um, the feedback is most meaningful when you try to help the person who wrote it, not, not just um, uh, force your own sensibility on it. Now, of course, you know, they want you know, different feedback, so your sensibility is going to be important. Um, but um, it, when you read it aloud, sometimes you can get into that frame of, of the piece. You, know, you can actually hear it and, and say, okay, this is not what I would have written, that's why I didn't write it, but now I can... Um, uh, uh, speak to it on that level, right? Okay. Questions? Yes? I just wanted to add that because that's actually super important when you're workshopping poetry or verse. Oh, exactly, yes. Because you yes. hear some of the rhythms and then you, kind of, you can pick up, you know, what is this? So it adds another whole element to your workshop if you understand, like, okay, I know what you were trying to do with the rhythm, here's where it doesn't work, here's where it does. Exactly, exactly. And I mean, you know, I, that, you're right, it's very important poetry. But I think even in prose, um, you hear certain things that you may not see. And that, that may actually help you, you know, sort of write a little bit more detailed feedback and, you know, catch things that maybe the author may have missed. Um, great. So, good. We've written our, our submission. We've read the submissions. Um, and uh, now we're going to get into the what to do during the workshop. But before we do that, I, we, at, we sort of look at the benefits of workshopping, why we would want to do it in the first place. This is what we get out of it. There are also what I might call challenges to workshopping. What are some of them that you maybe have experienced? One of the biggest challenges I face is with my attitude to, uh, to look at these submissions, including my own, from a point of view of respect and, and not like this is a chore. Hmm. When I, when I start to zone out on somebody's writing, I, I put it down, I go away, I take a walk or something, come back and give it my full attention because that's what it deserves. And, you know, sometimes it's hard. It is hard. Yeah. And it's, it's always hard. So, yeah. yeah. What else? If you have somebody that kind of takes a little trouble for it. Yes. So, um, uh, someone dominates the workshop. Right? You, you, we've, had, we've had that, yep. I think sometimes when people are just so painfully self-conscious that they sort of apologize for their work, they get in front of the yeah. work. Yeah, yeah. They get in front of the work. Yeah, work. yeah. And before you read this, just let me just say, I was really sleepy when I wrote this. Like, okay. <laughs> I was sleepy when I read it. <laughs> yeah, wait, this, this is why you were here to workshop. This is exactly what we're here to do. There's no need to apologize for anything. Yes? This is probably like especially true of like later workshops after like you really get to know like a lot of the people. Hmm. Yep. Very hard. It's nothing personal, man. You're just a terrible writer. <laughs> Sometimes people don't see anything. So the opposite, right? Yeah. Um, uh, just um, uh, receipts. And you're like wondering, is it something you wrote? Yeah. <laughs> what did you think about my piece? You didn't tell me. Yeah, exactly. What else? Yeah, and that's, that's hard on a, a couple levels. One, it's, um, you know, it, it makes it harder for you to sort of discern what they're trying to say, but sometimes, sometimes they're indirect on purpose, right? Because they're trying to couch a critique in, a, in you know, the nicest way possible. And, and, and that's, again, not helpful because we're here for the feedback, not for our egos. Yeah. I have a question. Um, because I haven't been in that many, obviously. Mm -hmm. And that we're all, you know, everybody's a critic. Mm -hmm. you know? Um, but what is the gauge between telling somebody honestly what you think and it being too harsh? Yes. You know, I, I think that's what everybody. Really this is exactly that's that. Thank you. Did I plant that question? No. Um, that's that's what we're going to try to answer, right? Because it is. Um, an important one to, to, it, to, again, to have an effective workshop. We can't all just say, this is really, really great. And we can't all just say, this was horrible, right? There's got to be some kind of way to, to 
give somebody what I would call, and I think what um, a lot of this boils down to is this um, two-word phrase that uh, we almost always hear in, 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 the, in the context of a workshop. Can anybody tell me what it is? It's a very, very, almost at this point, cliched phrase that you know, we talk about in, in terms of a workshop. It, it covers all of this in terms of dominating and, and, and finding the balance between honesty and, and being uh, respectful. You took this seminar before, so that's uh, <laughs> Okay, so this is the thing that um, I think a lot of uh, workshop boils down to is constructive criticism, okay? Um, and we use it almost, you know, you just sort of, you know, almost glibly sometimes without stopping to sort of consider what does it mean to be constructively critical? What does it mean? It's not just saying this doesn't work, but telling someone why. Yes. Yes, getting to the why. Now, I, um, yeah, Jill? But it also responds if, if the writer of the piece has asked a question along with the submission, constructive criticism will yeah. answer that question to the best of their Yeah, yeah, exactly. Did you think the opening was too fill in the blank? Here's what I thought about the opening, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I, you know, we're, we're all sort of engaged in, in sort of academic inquiry here, and I, I, want, I like this, you know, this term of constructive criticism. I'm very curious as to what it means. So I did some digging, um, extensive research, and here's what Wikipedia says. Um, <laughs> it's a joke. Um, this is from Wikipedia. I, I actually like this. This is why I, I, I'm, I'm sharing it. The purpose of constructive criticism is to improve the outcome. Constructive criticism must always focus on the work rather than the person. Personality issues must always be avoided. Constructive criticism is more likely to be embraced if the criticism is timely, clear, specific, detailed, and actionable. By adopting an open attitude to criticism, one may achieve greater personal development and help uncover blind spots. So, um, you know, I, I think that covers a lot of what, you know, what we understand constructive, constructive criticism to be. I like... This three-word phrase, I think it helps us answer you know, the, the question of how we actually approach uh, cr constructive criticism. I like this, th th this uh, phrase they use. It's intended to improve the outcome. Okay, so I think thinking about that way takes a little bit of pressure off of us, right? Because sometimes you get a piece and you think, this piece needs a lot of work and I know, I know exactly how to fix it. And you want to do everything, right, that you can. And, 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 and that may uh, sometimes uh, make you feel like you're, you know, going overboard or something or, you know, like how do you, you know, it takes some of the pressure off of you, right? As, 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 as work participants in a workshop, um, our goal is not to rewrite pieces. It's not to even to make them... Great, that's their author's goal. Um, your goal is to help the author improve it. That's it, get from A to B. Um, and if you think about it that way, I think it really helps us sort of uh, uh, create and couch those cr critiques constructively. Um, I wanted to read from, yeah, okay. So on the, on the back side of the Charles Baxter um, handout, to, uh, the second to last paragraph, he says, the tone of the workshop should be supportive, but rigorous, analytical, but not judgmental, non-competitive, vigilant against workshop jargon or preferred aesthetic strategies. Everyone should try to put their egos away. That part is in bold. Now, here's the thing about, um, you know, uh, about dealing with people we know personally, which, you know, this is, you know we're really kind of tight-knit community here, um, and dealing with um, how do you be honest but respectful is that part of that onus is on the person being critiqued, okay? Um, that phrase, open attitudes and criticism, in your Wikipedia definition. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. And, and how, do you, how do you toughen up your skin yeah. so you don't feel pummeled? And, and, you know, it's tough. I get, like I said, we're writers. We're writers. We're fragile. We've got egos. So... You know, I think part of it is just to kind of remember that this is not the place for your ego to be stroked, right? Going back to why you're here in the first place, that's why I keep this up, like, this, you're not here for everybody to tell you how much they loved your writing, 
Okay, that's not helpful to you. So um, you have to expect that people are going to tell you there are certain things about your writing that did not work as well for them, and that's okay. That's what you're there for. So you, you know, that helps check that ego a little bit. You have to walk in. Um, we have the benefit of having, you know, again, a really great community where we're very supportive and very genuine about it. So um, this, the, the workshop uh, at Fairfield, I think, is a very safe space. You know, you can walk in and know that you're not going, you, you know, and be vulnerable and know that it's going to be okay. Right? So, and that helps you to sort of lower your hackles. And, um, you know, on the, on the back of the um, do's and don'ts, that's why I said don't read them first because we're going to jump back and forth. You can read them at the end. Um, one of the don'ts that I think is, um, is important um, is near the end. It says don't react defensively to a critique. Okay? The workshop is not a courtroom, Tom Siegel. Um, he's a lawyer. There is no need for defense. And depending on the group, no need for explanation. Okay, somebody says, oh, I didn't understand this. You don't have to explain it to them. That's feedback. Just take the feedback, okay? Um, it's not our job to teach reading comprehension. In some cases, um, a reader may actually have missed something. Okay, and that's okay. That's, again, that's okay. It's not about going back and forth. A polite thank you very much along with a smile is often the best response. That's how I think we get past the... Uh, the back and forth, you know. I've been in workshops where that happens, where, you know, um, sometimes we use a cone of challenge, sometimes we don't. And um, somebody says something, and the, and the author, it's quick, I mean, you know, these are our babies, we know that, we're very close to our writing, and you know, your natural impulse may often be to defend it, and say, well, you read it wrong. <laughs> so, there. Um, I to say Please. Yeah. I am a child in the writing world. I'm going to take it. Yeah, or think of your peers as your children. I give them, you know, uh, but no, you're right. I mean, it's, <laughs> yes, well, we get to that too. You, have to, you, know, you get the criticism, you can take it and go for it. And, you can, and, and in some, some cases, you may not do anything with it. And that's okay. We'll get to that in a second. Yes? Two metaphors helped me. Okay. One was what is a metaphor? No, go ahead, sorry. <laughs> it's like a simile. Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's constructive criticism, is. yes. And the other is coaches. Sports coaches get away with saying the most hideous things about people if they're true and it will help them play the game better. Yeah. And so I'm working on my game. <laughs> well, we're writers. We have no idea what sports are. But, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> but I think it's a great example. <laughs> um, Here's a quote. I, didn't, I don't think I put this in your handout, but there's a quote from Neil Gaiman. I don't know if you like Neil Gaiman. Um, he says, I suspect that most authors don't really want criticism, not even constructive criticism. They want straight out, unabashed, unashamed, fulsome, informed, naked praise. <laughs> Arriving by the shipload every 15 minutes or so, and that's true. So um, that's the challenge of us going into it, is to say, this is actually, again, why we're here is to get that constructive feedback, and we won't take things personally, even if they're uh, given you know, uh, in, in, a, in a way that makes us feel fragile by our friends. Um, okay, so what I would like to do, let's see, I can erase this, yeah. Is think about constructive criticism in terms of verbs I can't remember what I said. Verbs. Just verbs. <laughs> what are some verbs that you associate with constructive criticism? I'll write them down as you say. Just yell it. To be. To be. To be? Or not. Are you being serious? Can you explain that? <laughs> what I mean is that if the verb is, are, or was too much, it's very passive. Got it. Got it. And yes. It doesn't do a lot of work in the sentence. Okay. Got it. Got it. Yes. Now, this is something, of course, that um, is not always um, effective in our writing, you know, being passive. So it's, not, it's not always ineffective, but it's mostly ineffective. Um, but also in a workshop, right? This is not the place to necessarily be timid, right? We're, again, it's a safe space, and this is what we're here to do. You're actually not helping the, uh, the author if you're holding back. What other verbs? To flesh out. 
flesh out. Yeah, you don't need the infinitive form. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Flesh out. That's what a very uh, common thing that we get, especially in prose. I don't know about poetry, but um, you know, often what what the, re the 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 writer wants to know is like, what stood out to you, and maybe maybe that's that's something that could be fleshed out. Yeah. What else? Perfect. Perfect. You should teach this next time. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that um, the, the important thing about prioritizing is that you know that uh, uh, we do have a finite time in workshop. And so it's actually not always uh, possible to get everything out. And um, just make sure that you, you know, everything is, is written down. And in that workshop, you want to address the bigger things where you have the opportunity of all being together in one room. Um, sorry, there was a hand. I can say compress. Compress, yes. Sometimes there's too much of something. You say, this actually doesn't need to be 17 pages. This could be a paragraph. I would just say lift up, because there's a way to give criticism that makes the person feel hopeful and Absolutely. excited. Absolutely. OK. Yes, we are going to check our egos. However, we're still human. And you know, there's definitely ways to tell somebody that something is not working their piece without making them feel like shit. We know that. There are ways to make them feel like shit, and that's also not very effective. Okay. So that's a very good one. We do have a responsibility, I think, to each other to, to lift up. Yes? Build. Build. Again, we are here because we are writers. We're all writers. We're all accomplished in some way. But we're writers in training. We are still building up ourselves. And that, yeah, that, that's what you mean. Like, you know, we're helping each other, you know, construct. It's just a and synonym of build. Just that, but you, I mean, you have seven other people. Yeah. It's layer upon layer upon yes. layer upon layer. Exactly. 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 Deepen. Deepen. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Feel the pain. Yeah. So then select. Okay. Good. The reason I wanted to um, any more. Rework too big. Nothing is too big here, young Jesse. <laughs> <laughs> Detail, yeah, so um, as, a, as a verb, right? So um, the reason I want to think about it in verbs, because, I mean, it is a very, again, it's not a very passive thing. It's very active. You know, these are things that you're consciously doing to help the author in, in, in the hot seat um, um, improve the outcome of their piece. Okay, so, I, you know, I want to think of it, you know, um, and I think these are all actually uh, great verbs because they show sort of different sides of it, right? Um, I think that um, you know you, you do want to encourage, right? That's a word I like to use with my students. Uh, you did this not so well, but I want to encourage you to do it better. Okay. Um, um, but, but, don't lie. Mm -hmm. Don't lie to people. It's not helpful them. It's not easy to hear that something is just not working, but if it's not, tell them, right? You have to be honest. Um, I think we want to critique. Okay, I mean, uh, what I mean is that even um, when a piece seems really good, sometimes we do get a piece that's uh, further along in the process, and you're like, this is really good. Um, you gotta find something that's Less good, you know. You have to find. This is why they're here. Um, uh, however, we know, because we're all writers, that um, we can all write a story, um, w you know, a paragraph uh, that's very effective. And there's, let's say, thirty of us in here. We could write it thirty different ways, each of which are very good. Okay, so um, one thing to, uh, that uh, I like to say is that we should allow writers to be writers. Just because you would write something differently does not mean that that's not a good way to write it. Um, and I have to stop myself from doing this all the time because I think I'm, just, I'm the best writer ever. So I'm like, well, no, 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 I would write this. But you know, like, um, it actually is, is one way to learn sort of different ways to, 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 do, to write something. So you have to allow people to have their own voices. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it's, it's always like, you know, do this, but temperate. Do this, but temperate. And, and, and the overall watchword, I would say, in constructive criticism 
is to find that balance. Then, what would you say about the piece you had us go over? I will in a second. <laughs> Slow your roll. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this might be a little obvious, but this, there's one thing that I always have trouble with in a workshop, and I try to stop myself from doing, is that I, I think I spend more time focusing on what I'm going to say next about this person's work than actually listening to what this person and other people have to say. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 it's, I, not just in workshop, but in conversation as well. I always find myself trying to think about, okay, I, I, because this person said this, I'm going to say this. Okay. So I'm always trying to insert myself. And um, this, uh, personally, I, yeah, I try to stop myself from doing that all the time and try to really listen. Yeah. Pay more, put more focus into listening than actually trying to put my own response out there. Perfect. I, I think I planted you too, because that's exactly the segue that we were going into. Um, yeah, so. Um, this is all about sort of, um, you know, how do we give con constructive criticism? criticism. Um, the other side, of course, is that when you're in the hot seat, you have to learn to receive constructive criticism. That's checking your ego. But as June said, a lot of it is just listening. Um, many workshops use what's called the Iowa format, which was, um, I think, kind of pioneered at the University of Iowa. Um, anyone know what the I Iowa format is? It means the person being critiqued cannot speak, exactly, right? You get the, you wear the cone of silence, or whatever people call it. It's, you know, um, it means that, you know, you have to sit there and just listen to everybody just beat up your piece, and you can't say squat. Um, you know, I think that uh, that's one way. It's, it's not the only way to do it. However, uh, we know that uh, even if you're not being workshopped, you know, there's uh, s such a great opportunity to be in a room with all these other writers and to hear what they have to say about the p same piece that you read. Um, so listening is, is, is vitally important. Let's see what... Um, I think Charles Baxter has something to say about listening. Yeah, on the back side of the Baxter piece, you know, he says, um, you know, some people um, use the Iowa format, some people don't, but uh, it, it may be useful to experiment with how much the author can participate in terms of asking questions, raising issues, responding to questions. Um, uh, but certainly, the author's certain responsibility is to listen carefully. You, you know, you want to hear everything. You, you, this is why you're here. You want to hear everything that people had to say, how they reacted, what, what's... What, made, what moved them? You know, you, you don't want to miss anything, right? Uh, that's what Steven Tyler said. Okay. Uh, and then... All right, I jumped ahead there. What we might do now... What time does this end? 3.15? I think we have time. Is do a, lis uh, a listening exercise. Does anybody want to do that? Yeah. I need three volunteers. I have three chairs. One, two, please come. Three, great. Okay, so did you, any of you take this seminar with me in the summer? Yeah, no. You did? Yeah. Okay, that's fine. You can still do it. Um, well, you already it was did a this. Long time ago. Okay, I know. Um, <laughs> on the morning, please have a seat, of uh, September 11th. 2001. Um, I was asleep in my dorm room when I was in college. And um, I remember my, ro my roommate waking me up and saying, yeah, look at the TV, something's happening. And, you know, so we're, together we watched. The first plane had already hit. And, we, you know, we sort of watched dumbstruck everybody else as the second plane hit and, then, and, and the mayhem and pan pandemonium and, and buildings falling and people dying. And um, the, re the rest of the day, of course, you know, classes were canceled, major cities were on lockdown. And um, I think the rest of the day and the rest of the week, a lot of us walked around in kind of a stupor, kind of wondering what was happening. So when I give you this piece of chalk, mm -hmm. you will start on the morning of 9-11, okay. 2001, and, t and give us, you know, just 20 seconds of what. Okay. My kids had all left for school, and I was supposed to go sing a funeral. I was on the computer and a friend text messaged me from Helsinki saying, could you please turn on the news? We heard that a plane crashed into the World Trade Center. And I texted back, 
I, wow, was it an accident? And he texted back, I think not, because a second plane crashed. My sister worked at Morgan Stanley. We live in Stratford, which is about an hour from there. And um, I stayed on the phone until I found her. And then I went to the funeral late and I told everybody at church what happened. And the priest gave me a very hard time because I missed the funeral. But they couldn't get the body to the burial because all the bridges to New York were closed and the cemetery was in New York. And he said, I've lived through a great many things, including the bombing of Dresden. And this is like pulling off a scab that's grown over that. But what I've learned that got me through it is, you have to keep in mind two very important things. Things over which you have some control and things over which you have absolutely no control whatsoever. He said, you have no control over this bombing, but you had control over whether or not you attend the funeral. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Pass the shock on. So I lived in Brooklyn, um, and I happened to be outside on my porch going through a list of what I needed for groceries. Um, and then the plane hit the building. So I honestly thought an atom bomb had been dropped on the city because it was so loud. I mean, this is something so shockingly loud. And um, I just immediately started shaking and, and um, then I heard people screaming and I looked up because I was on the fourth floor of a brownstone with the balcony facing the water. You know, and um, and then I saw like all these people on the rooftops, and I'm thinking, what is going on? <laughs> and I was so shocked and afraid. I don't think I've ever been. Oh, I don't think I've ever been that terrified. And then, of course, I ran in to turn on the television, and then I, <laughs> I was. Um, my father was a pilot, and they were saying, I think it's a small plane, and I said, Oh, there's no way that. Um, it was like an atom bomb. I mean, it was so, so loud. And so I packed things. And while everybody was running toward the water, which is the promenade in Brooklyn, I ran to the bank and um, took out a whole bunch of money and shaking. And there was stealth bombers. I mean, it was just insane. It, it was a surreal, surreal moment. And um, the the woman in the bank, there was only me in the bank, by the way. Um, the woman in the bank said, you know, you, you really need to calm down. And I was like, there is nothing to be calm about. And, um, and then the rest of the day, um, I, my husband was in the um, subway when it happened, but he, he got out at Canal Street and it took him about nine hours to get home. And so I ended up with probably the entire Brooklyn Heights in a bar, mm -hmm. getting completely shit faced mm -hmm. um, as we watched like more horror, you know. But that was like the only place you could feel like safe was, you know, with your neighborhood getting plowed. Mm -hmm. There you go. Uh, well, not to make light of a serious situation, but uh, I was in Korea then, so I guess I was asleep on that. <laughs> Well, I grew up in Korea, uh, and I came to Connecticut two years ago, and um, I remember, for Koreans, well, yeah, of course it was big news, it was very big news, but, um, you know, the next, I was in high school back then, and uh, the next day, it was, there was more excitement, to be honest, about, wow, something big happened, this is, wow, and, uh, you know, with conspiracy theories, and, <coughs> wow, it's, you know, all that, but um, uh, what we had more reaction to wasn't, uh, the uh, event itself, but the aftermath, because um, South Korea itself had, was not just because of North Korea, but in other cases as well, has uh, encountered some terrorism. A uh, few years before that, an entire airliner was um, blown out of the sky, and um, what the reaction we had to, after that was uh, a few months later. Um, well, you have to understand that for South Koreans, um, America is kind of like the promised land. You know, even till now, there's still a distinct idea of the American dream. And I guess, in a way, I came here with, with a similar idea. And a lot of people back home have a very idealistic idea of America. 
you know, about everything about America. You know, I, I remember talking to my dad and he says, you know, something bad, you know, politicians, you know, would never do something bad like that in America. You know, cops would never do something like that in America. Yeah. My dad would always say that when he gets on the news. My mom actually saw, I said that a couple of days ago because there's a big uh, demonstration in Korea right now. But uh, the most uh, common theme that came up was that, wow, uh, so uh, two uh, buildings went down, a lot of people died, so, but uh, when that happens to our country, uh, you know, we move on, but wow, the whole world is like in upheaval because of this. And it just, for us at least, it was like, oh wow, because that's their white people. You know, they had that kind of white people privilege. Well, because it was white people, you know, they get to do that. And um, it wasn't it wasn't content. It wasn't contemptuous, it wasn't that we hated white people, it was that kind of just acceptance that um, because this happened to white people, oh it, it makes more sense that it's fake news. And um, this kind of at that point it just made sense. Even okay, so um, somebody tell me what Garrett Garrett's story was. Perfect. <laughs> wow. Were you taking notes? I know. <laughs> okay, that's very good. Um, June, can you tell me Anne's story? Yeah, uh, she was. Um, uh, she was. She was. Uh, the first thing she did was uh, she talked to her husband, uh, and. Um, I'm sorry. It's tough. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. She, okay. I remember she. Um, her husband was uh, caught in traffic, but. Uh, uh, okay, that was obviously that part. That was the intent of the exercise. Don't feel bad. Um, you know, when somebody's talking, and, and this is happens around the table of a workshop, and somebody's saying something, jars something in your mind. You're like, oh, I, can't, I can't wait to say that. This is exactly what you're saying earlier, right? So when we're thinking about what we want to say, we're not listening. That's it. So I want us to think about in a in a workshop setting, oh, actively. Know, that's why you called on June to come and <laughs> Yes, exactly. Because obviously. <laughs> Everybody in the audience was listening. You guys weren't thinking, but yeah, well, if you tried to think about what exactly, to do exactly. Next. So he had something else on his mind and was not in a position to actively listen. And I wanted to think about listening as a very active thing. Like, I mean, it's not just. It's again, nothing we do in a workshop is passive. Train yourself when somebody's talking to to listen, to focus on you know the important things. Uh, maybe you know listen to some keywords, whatever you know, the, whatever strategy you use. I mean, maybe work on some listening strategies. It will help you immensely, both as a workshopy and a workshopper. So, thank you so much um, to our three volunteers. Um, the other part of the workshop, obviously, a lot of it is uh, discussion, going back and forth, speaking, actively listening. A, lot of, a, a big part of it is written. Um, so let's, uh, let's look at the workshop do's and don'ts. On the first page, do. This comes from one of the Fairfield MFA faculty. At the very, la at the, the very last paragraph, it says, do type out a paragraph or two on a couple of craft elements for each workshop sample uh, piece you read. In fiction, for example, this might mean writing about point of view and dialogue in one piece, and let's say character and setting in another. After you've written notes on the manuscript, take time to formulate your thoughts on some technical elements that seem particularly important in any piece. Uh, perhaps they're particularly strong or not. And then express those thoughts coherently to your classmate, referring to examples on specific pages. And remember that it's not your job as a workshop commenter to fix something you think is weak in a piece. It's your job to point out the problems, allowing the writer to formulate his or her own strategies. Um, a couple uh, bullets above that, it says do cite page numbers and use quotes from the text to illustrate a point when critiquing others. 
Um, I think these are super important, right? Um, again, this goes back to when we do our second, maybe third read, and we're, we're making uh, notations on the manuscript. Um, we're doing this in a way to help the person. Um, so, you know, don't hold back. Be very generous with your critique, even if you think it's, it's, you're being harsh. Be generous because that's actually helping the person improve the outcome. Um, write notes on the manuscript and then synthesize them in a you know, short, could be just a one page. Some people write much more than that. Obviously, we know we get from our mentors sometimes very detailed um, notes. Um, but you're in that workshop too, and it's your job to write detailed notes um, and to not just say, I liked this, okay? I think it says on the back, the fourth one down, don't say that you liked or disliked something because that's only telling the author something about you. It's like saying, I like chocolate ice cream. That's great for you. Um, what worked about it? Um, you know, um, it's, it's, it's very subjective, right? So, you know, um, don't just say, oh, this character would, would, you know, point to an example on page three when this happens. And, the, you know, that's actually helpful feedback. Um, and, 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 and when you don't do that, you're doing a disservice to the workshop and uh, to everybody involved, including yourself. Um, oh, and I wanted to hand this out. Um, because I think it's helpful, I can just take one and pass it out, um, to use a fairly consistent language when we're talking about our writing um, and to use fairly consistent notations. I mean, you know, it, it, you, uh, if you're doing it uh, by hand, sometimes people use track changes in Word, and I think that's very fancy, and I don't do it, but that's great. But if you're doing it by hand, you know, make notations that uh, are intelligible, that are understandable, um, and you can refer to this sheet that's going around, which are uh, it's just a list of very common copy editing notes, right? So that, you know, if, if, if we're using the same language, then it's much easier to communicate. That's the general rule. You can quote me on that. Um, Okay, okay, actually now is where I want to talk briefly about the story with bird that, um, the birds, uh, no, singular. There's only one bird, it's the same bird. Maybe there was no bird. Yeah. What do you guys think about the bird? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, some of you guys didn't get it, here. It's just a short piece. Let me, um, did, did everybody get a chance to read it? Did everybody get a chance? I said the instruction was to treat this as, as you would any workshop piece. So um, did anybody do that? You want to show me, like, well, how did you do that? Maybe we could get a couple of uh, uh, volunteers to show. Okay, so, okay, we see some markings up there and there. Great, good, good. Yes, the idea is to not really, you know, is to not have any page without some kind of notation because, you know, it, I mean, not, not to be too arbitrary about it, but it's to read it closely and find something to, to, to note. Um, did anybody write a short critique of it, as you would in any other workshop? Does anybody want to share any part of that critique with... Heather, thanks for volunteering. <laughs> Okay. Anybody else? That's great. Thank you. Uh, one paragraph. However, the interesting thing to me upon reading this was rereading it was to discover that there is not one word in dialogue which lacks both the author's intent and the weakness. The filter of his heavy of this remembrance, the very economy of the prose goes down smoothly, but it masks a heavy predetermination that begins the first clause in the first sentence, somewhere near the end. Excellent. So, you know, you're, you're on a downward trip right from the beginning. Excellent. Very good. Anybody else? Did anybody recognize this story? It was published as the title story with Bird in the October 6th issue uh, to 2014 of The New Yorker. Um, 
and um, it's written by somebody who's um, published very widely and, and, and uh, been very well reviewed and awarded. Um, I deliberately chose this piece because I really can't stand any of the fiction that they publish. Um, but, um, you know, uh, as, as an example show that you can always workshop a piece, I mean, this is a piece that has been published in The New Yorker, which is, in some circles, some measure of success. But, um, <laughs> But, you know, there's, there are things that this author can look at, okay? This is, restrained is a nice word, you know, to use for this. I was getting a little uh, impatient with this as I read it. Um, you know, but of course, it's, you know, um, this, is, this is the nice way, the, the constructive way to say it. You showed a lot of restraint. You were very subtle. What the fuck does this mean? <laughs> uh, you know, I like that you had an impression on first reading and then on rereading, right? So you had a different impression. You, you focused on the lack of dialogue. It, it went down smooth the first time and the second time when it went back a couple clunky um, passages. I, th I thought so. I mean, again, you know, I think it's, a, it's, it's obviously uh, it's, it's a story that accomplishes a lot. I mean, you know, and, and um, I, I, I deliberately uh, shared it without any identifiers so that, you know, you wouldn't, you know, to want to show you how you might read it differently if you knew it was published in The New Yorker. Um, but the fact is that, um, you know, any piece you get from uh, in, in a workshop um, uh, is not done. That's just the nature of writing. There's always more you can do to it. Um, did anybody really like it? Yeah. I, I hesitate to say this because now we know it's from the New Yorker. But, <laughs> um, you know what I liked about it? I liked that it was so, re it was really one dimensional. Yes. But, but the, the delivery of the inevitability and the sort of ennui of, of breaking down the relationship with the balloons and everything else, I, thought, I, mean, I, just, I thought the texture of it was sort of smothering. But mm -hmm, it did have a very um, uh, determined uh, focus to it, which I like. Yeah, that's true. Yes. It's interesting. I thought the writing was so uneven. I mean, hmm. like the beginning of it, you know, it was. I don't have my copy of this book. You know, so we stopped cold, both of us in the middle of February. You know, it's sort of like that, where he's using, you know, February cold and he's using the word cold. And I didn't buy it. I yeah. Mean, from the beginning, I didn't really find him genuine, except for when he is talking about the bird staring at him. Because that, I thought, was, you know, when he weaves that back into the memory of yeah. him and his girlfriend making love in the whirlpool with the steam. Yes. And then they and the deer. Stared the yeah. The that was freaky to me. That was really freaky. Yeah. Scary, but it was really well <laughs> It was very well. Yeah, no, I think, I mean, I, again, you know, this is, a, uh, I think, a good example of how something can be very accomplished in some ways and have s s things you can critique about it. Okay, that's the point. You can't just say, this is a really good piece. Um, it is a, a decent piece for The New Yorker. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, okay. Oh, I wanted to hand this out, too, because now we're going into... Anybody else want to share anything about their critiques of the piece? Any responses? That's right. And then I know this, okay, I'm free. Yes. So yes. I, I didn't bring my notes, unfortunately. I had so you just ripped it apart. I ripped oh it. Oh, my God. I yeah. And then I looked at the notes for the workshop. That's my notes. And I tried to read it again. And then I said, I got all choked up. I was going to try to find positive things. So that was <laughs> What is your, are you new? I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Yeah, I'm new. And oh. I'm from Norway. That's Yes, I was just going to ask your name. I can't say your line here. Oh, Beth. <laughs> Beth, excellent. Welcome. Thank you. So that it became a very interesting exercise. Yeah. Really Absolutely. But I want to say... That honesty that I had. Yes. I, didn't, I knew there was nobody here. Yes. But, but that, I, that, that, I was saying one thing about that. So that was an exercise. It was, it was practice. To, to say that this is nobody in the room. Don't worry about hurting feelings. But however... Now that you've done that, you know, you've ripped it apart, that is actually what you have to do with, with, your, your, with, your, with the, other, the poems in your workshops, right? Is to not couch or change or coddle because you know this person. Not everybody here is even that nice, so you have to be nice to them. <laughs> um, so now we're going to go to... Um, yeah, so that, the big chunk, of, obviously, is during the workshop. We're there for almost three hours, and a lot happens. So that was the, all the during. 
Then after four days of being in the same room and finally wanting to kill each other, we get to after the workshop. Okay. And here's where I think it gets tricky, but also here's where uh, things happen. Um, we know that the workshop is not done just because, uh, because we've left the island. It continues. There are things that we have to do after the workshop to, um, to make it effective, okay? Um, what are some of those things? You get, sometimes you have two people who read the same paragraph and have exact opposite reactions to it. This was my favorite part. I think you should cut this. <laughs> right, okay. What to do and what to do, what to do. What else? I think it's important to be timely about it because I know maybe the first couple of I would look at the comments until like a month later. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, staying in touch with the, some of the people in your workshop that you can Because if you do have, you know, a second question afterwards, you can always email them. You know, what's the time you their emails, so that's They don't disappear. They're, and, they, and they're usually very uh, happy to help. I like to rewrite very quickly the other And then save it as a new version, mm -hmm. but rewrite it quickly. Yeah, so that goes back to timing, yep. Anything else? Okay, so again, uh, as, as great, a lot of this is reviewing and, and it's good to uh, actually be in this room where we can sort of share the best practices. Um, but yes, I mean, one of the first things, you, would, you know, sometimes, let's start with timing, like, you know, after four days of, of critique and, 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 and sometimes very intensive and sometimes very emotional critique, um, you're just fried. And sometimes you do want to give yourself a, a, a solid week where you just don't think about it. Um, but, when you, but you do have to come back to that because um, you've gotten now, um, you know, uh, maybe half a dozen uh, 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 pieces of feedback on your writing and now you have to figure out what to do with that feedback. Um, we know that uh, responding to the feedback does not mean just going through each critique and making every change that it suggests, right? We know that. But how, the, the question is how do we de decide, first of all, you know, like, uh, first of all, how do we even understand what the critique crit is saying? Sometimes, as you know, we said earlier, sometimes the critique crit is a little indirect. Um, sometimes we, it's hard to understand what they mean. Um, and uh, that's why I handed out that, um, this, this handout here. I think that, um, you know, we know the delete symbol and the insert, transpose, um, sometimes you just want to tell somebody, you know, this would make a really good doorstop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, or Larry, as Larry Bloom used to like to say, you know, you have one too many exclamation points when you only had one. Um, I like this one, needs more bow chicka wow wow. So that's, um, that's just a little bit of humor. <laughs> um, I wanted to hand out this piece to you. You can't read it now. This is a, this is a piece uh, that was published in the New York Times earlier this year that kind of talks about how do you, one, understand, two, synthesize, and three, assess the feedback you get in a, in a writing workshop. Um, I think the answer to that is obviously going to sort of vary from person to person, right? Um, you are the author. Ultimately, you are the one who must make that choice. Um, and that choice can be made uh, by thinking about uh, what your in original intention with the piece was, what, uh, what, the in what the piece's intention has become, right? Everything must be, you know, I think you can use the same guideline as, uh, what, you know, as the constructive criticism, okay? Does this piece of feedback help improve the outcome? Okay, that's it. And if it doesn't, it doesn't, and it's okay. You may bid it adieu with fond wishes. 
If it does, it does. You can try to find a way to synthesize it. It may not be immediately clear. And as um, I forget somebody said, you can follow up with, uh, with one of your workshop participants and say, hey, you know, can we talk more about this? Can you elaborate on what you meant by such and such? Um, uh, Charles Baxter on the, on the back has a um, really good advice here. Um, uh, near the uh, third to last paragraph, he says, a workshop may be frustrating if there has been wide disagreement or if um, the author feels especially attached or vulnerable about a piece. The buddy system can, can sometimes help, singling out some other member of the workshop to ask a few hours later or a few days after for a summary of what was said uh, or, or even to review the critique you got from the instructor together, right? I mean, you know, again, most of the work we do as writers is in isolation. So when we have this opportunity to actually, you know, collaborate with, other, with, with, with others, use it, you know, say, hey, you know, can, we, can you go through this with me and see, you know, what you think? Um, it's, it's, it's immeasurably helpful because it just expands your insight and sometimes it, it reveals something brand new that was not even said in workshop, but, you know, just talking about it can, can, can spark that, that, um, that awakening. Um, And then, you know, the idea is to keep working on that piece, rewriting, revising. Sometimes you do a really quick rewrite. Sometimes you wait uh, a few weeks and say, like, now let me see how this works, you know. Um, but, the, but, but the idea is to not think of the workshop, to never think of the workshop as a finite thing. It doesn't end just because the workshop is ended here. Because now you have to go and actually do something with that feedback, which is what you wanted to in the first place. Um, so we have a cup. A couple minutes, we don't, but, I, but um, I'm going to anyway. Um, is there any qu questions, comments? Any? Feel free to, yes. Miss Gorton. I just wanted to say when I first started workshops, hi everyone, I'm an alumna. When, alumna. when I started, I thought it was my job to shred <laughs> everybody's pieces. I thought that's what a writer did. I found all the bad stuff, and when you critique, Critiquing is only about the negative. But by the time I left here, I realized that the feedback that I used most and that was most helpful was identifying what was really working in a piece so that person wouldn't cut it out. Exactly. And also finding what was confusing. So it wasn't always about, uh, this is terrible, you need to redo this. It was, I was confused here. So make sure in your workshop you're asking questions and also listening to the questions that people are asking each other about your work. Exactly. Because you're not going to be able to defend it when it's in a book. You know, you want the, re the readers to not be confused. So exactly. If you hear confusion, write down that's a, That's a signal, yes. Yes, I, I totally agree. And that's, I think that goes back to the idea of not just critiquing, but critiquing constructively, right? And he said, you know, part of our g goal, part of actually, it's sometimes a more effective way to make somebody a better writer is to lift them up and say, this part you did here was really, really good. If you make more of it like that, this piece would be that much better, right? Um, th this is a really funny thing on the, uh, on the back side of the, of the don'ts. The uh, faculty member who sent this to me uh, shows me that these are all real lines that were uttered in a workshop. The faculty member has a notebook in which he or she writes these down. Don't ever say, oh, this is brand new and I didn't spend much time on it. Uh, don't say, I hate this piece and I've decided to just drop it. Don't say, yeah, I knew it was crappy but I didn't have anything else to send. These things really hurt people because <laughs> they spend time on it. Um, don't say, I send the good part to the other workshop. I think I was in that workshop. Um, don't say, I wrote this piece when I was a sophomore in high school and I still love it. <laughs> Don't say my mother, friend, uh, boyfriend, girlfriend thinks nobody cares. Uh, don't say this character is based on my grandma, and she really is that sweet. Uh, don't say this is an experimental form, and I don't think you understand it. That may, that may well be true, but maybe you shouldn't do it. Uh, don't say nothing happens in this story because the character is clinically depressed and can't get out of bed. <laughs> don't say why didn't you like the description of his dream on pages 5 to 19. Oh, you didn't know it was a dream? I've been down that road. And don't say this character is based on me and I'm clinically depressed. Um, I think if you follow these instructions, you'll be well on your way. Thank you very much. Yeah.